The jury deliberations are underway in the trial of these three men in Georgia who are accused of murdering Ahmaud Arbery. William Bryan, Gregory McMichael, and his son Travis McMichael are accused of chasing down and killing the 25-year-old. Arbery was jogging through a neighborhood in February of last year. The men have pleaded not guilty, claiming self-defense. All three could face life in prison if convicted. As promised, Omar Villafranca is joining us now from outside the courthouse in Brunswick, Georgia. Uh, Omar, the jury is about to begin deliberations. Give us an overview mm -hmm. of the closing arguments and what will the jury be looking at to make their decision? Well, for the closing arguments, we heard the prosecutor basically say that it was assumptions and decisions made in a driveway that they saw a black man running down the street and they decided to go and get him and kill him. Now, the defense is saying they thought Arbery was a burglar uh, and they were trying to make a citizen's arrest and then it turned into uh, a self-defense issue. That's what the defense is saying. Then there was a rebuttal by the prosecution and she basically was spelling things out saying this is not true. Look at the facts um, as she has presented in, during uh, her opening statements, not only in her opening statements, but in her cross-examination as well. So at this point, it's handed to the jury. You were talking about uh, what the jury is going to be looking at. They, are, of course, were read the charges, what to look for, um, and the exact definitions of those charges. So they're going to be looking at everything from the testimony of Travis McMichael, uh, also what the GBI said. Uh, other facts of the case, they'll be looking at uh, statements that the, the defendants made to police. Uh, and as long as those statements that we saw body cam video, we saw interviews, uh, there was also written statements, all that can be brought in uh, in their deliberation. So it's going to be interesting to see. We started the timer uh, when they're basically going in there. So, I mean, if we could guess, no clue, no mm. clue. <laughs> Um, at one point, the prosecution's rebuttal to closing arguments was interrupted by the defense uh, to push for a mistrial. Mm -hmm. Again, we've heard several pushes for mistrials. Can you explain what the defense yes. took issue with? The, the defense had an issue with the way that uh, Prosecutor Donikowski was explaining the, the citizen's arrest law to the jury. And that's big because citizen's arrest is basically what the defense is saying uh, which is what caused them to, to go after Arbery. Now, initially, when the jury was not there, uh, the judge was basically saying a citizen's arrest has to be made if somebody physically sees a felony happening or knew that one that just happened, and the arrest has to happen immediately. Now, the defense has said that is going to gut our case and is going to help the prosecution, but that's the way the law uh, was written at the time. So they were objecting the way that Dunikowski was presenting it to the jury, but the judge waved it off and said, you know, continue. Interesting note, you don't see that. I mean, it does happen, but you do see uh, every once in a while uh, some objections during closing arguments. It happened also during uh, the defense's closing arguments. There were some uh, objections from the prosecution. So it's been contentious uh, on both sides. You mentioned the mistrials. Just about every day that we've covered this, one particular defense attorney, Kevin Goff, who's the attorney for William Roddy Bryant, has found a reason to call for a mistrial every time the judge keeps his calm and just has a smirk and bats it down and says, let's keep going with this trial. But every day he's just about called for a mistrial. Uh, Omar, are there any concerns that the jury, uh, has this been expressed um, by anybody that you've spoken to that the jury might rush through the deliberations because of the upcoming holiday? That's something that uh, it, it, it hasn't been discussed. It's on everybody's mind, um, and we're trying to see how the jury is reacting to basically this long process. I mean, we're talking 10 days of, of testimony here. Uh, yesterday, when the defense finished their cl uh, closing uh, statements, closing arguments, uh, the prosecution gets their rebuttal. And sh she said, I'm going to need my full two hours to do it. The defense was said, fine, let's do it. Judge said, let me ask the jury. Went in there, and the jury says, uh-uh. Eh ready to go home. Let's go ahead and call it a day. Uh, that's why she had to basically do it today. I'm not a professional jury reader. I understand those people are paid very well, uh, but you know, they've had to deal with 10 days of this and the testimony has not been, I mean, it's heavy stuff in the, in the rebuttal. We saw more pictures of uh, Ahmaud Arbery uh, there in Satilla Shores, uh, pictures of the death scene, pictures of his face alive and dead. So, it was uh, it, it was tough. 
Yeah, so this brings me to his mother, who has sat through um, some challenging testimony, incredibly challenging video, and there's a lot of video in this case. Um, the uh, summing mm -hmm. up of the case uh, over the past couple of days from the defense attorneys, certainly some stuff that's really hard to, to listen to. Um, you spoke with him, or oh, rather her. How is she dealing with all of this heading into deliberations? Well, you're right, it has been challenging for her. I mean, when we talked to her last year, um, she had not seen the video. And I talked to her this year, of course. And mind you, this happened in 2020. We've been in contact with her and had several interviews with her. She still hadn't seen the video. She said she had not seen it clear all the way through. She decided during this trial now to see it. And it's been traumatic. And it's not just the video. You and I have seen the video. America has seen the video. The world has. That there's autopsy photos. There's crime scene photos. That is when we would hear audible gasps from the Arbery family. Today, when they were showing some of the pictures of Ahmaud Arbery uh, lying on the, on, on the ground there on the road in Satilla Shores, Marcus Arbery got up and just bolted out. It was something that he was not, a, not ready for. And Wanda Cooper-Jones, his mother, just basically put her hand uh, over her face and her attorneys basically pulled her in. Um, but, but that's tough to take in. Uh, very tough to take in, especially since the video she said when I asked her, you've seen the video, you, you don't react as much anymore. And she said, I, I want to take it in. I want to understand what my son's life was like right before he passed away. But she admits she also wants to match up testimony to what she's seeing on the video. She's almost playing a detective for all her own peace of mind. So it's been tough um, and she is getting help. There's uh, victims advocates that are helping her, um, but it's not easy for any parent. Yeah, you know, often uh, you see when family members are put in this position that kind of almost uh, part of their therapy is to become advocates for their loved one that is no longer there. You know, to do that investigative work, to ask those questions, and perhaps it's a really kind of good way to channel your grief. I don't know, um, but we've seen it before, Omar. Yeah, you're right. And, 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 and let me say something. She, she not only has been, has this been, she said, you know, better for her mind to kind of process things. But she was also a detective in this. She's the one who pointed out some of the lags in this investigation early last year. She's the one who found a connection between uh, the defendants and the prosecutor's office and raised that to where, okay, mm. this prosecutor's got to go. Then the second one, she, second uh, Barnhill uh, prosecutor, she finds another connection between them via Facebook. I mean, she was doing some serious Facebook scrolling and found another connection, which forced them to get off the case. So not only has she been detective, she's also now trying to find some sort of uh, therapeutic closure through this. And she told us that just getting here uh, to this point, the closing arguments, handing it to jury is very emotional for her. And because of this case, right, Omar, this idea of a citizen's arrest, it doesn't exist anymore in this state. You're right. It it, it, does, it, it is no longer uh, basically around in the, in the books in the state of Georgia. Not only that, Georgia was one of a few of a handful of states that didn't have state hate crime laws on the books. And she went up to Atlanta and got them on the books, and they passed it in the legislative session. So she has not been sitting idly by while this happened and just waiting for this case. She has been very proactive, uh, not only in her son's case, but what's going on in the state of Georgia. All right. Omar Villafranca, thank you so much. Thank you, Vlad Emery.